Well, my name is Jason Watson. I'm the managing partner of Watson CPA Group. My wife and I founded this firm probably seven years ago. It's kind of hard to say. It was like we opened up our, our doors one day and we can mark it in history. But uh, over time, we have grown our firm from 30, 30 uh, clients to over 2,000 today. And one of the segments that we have is expats. Uh, probably about six years ago, we had a gentleman from the Marshall Islands call us up looking for some tax help. And we were a, kind of a, a young firm back then. <laughs> and we were like, sure, we'll help you with anything. you know. So we got into the books and did a lot of research and did all that stuff. And then he told a friend who told a friend. And you know, next thing you know, we're probably representing maybe 250 to 300 people worldwide just for expat type of taxes. And we also have a lot of folks now, we have two clients that just recently in the last four weeks have, um, they were like insurance sales people here in the United States. They created an S corporation in the US, which we helped them form. And now they're living, both of these guys, and they didn't even know each other, but they both live in Panama. And so now they have an S corporation, which we specialize in as well. And they're also expats, which we specialize in as well. Gotcha. And so we can bridge that gap for them. So we, we run their payroll, we take care of all their corporate governance needs, and then we also help them with their personal filing for expat taxes. Okay, all right. So then when it comes to the expat CPA you know, type role, and this is something that's just kind of evolved from helping other expats and, and such. It has, yeah. So once we started to see a lot of traction and once we discovered that there's a real unique need for this. I mean, I think there's only probably five or six accounting firms in the country that like specialize in it mm -hmm. as a core competency. There might be 10, but th there's not a lot. Sure. Uh, we discovered that there's a real need out there. You know, and we, we have all the technology. That was one of the things that we already had handled because a lot of our clients are also pilots and flight attendants. Okay. And they're all over the country and all over the world as well. And so we had to have good good technology. We had to, to be able to exchange things electronically through a secure portal. We had to be able to Skype. We had to be able to do a lot of things to help these guys, you know, be able to communicate back to the U.S. to get their finances in order. Um, you know, Skyping is not a big deal, but you know, I've gotten up at five in the morning because that's when the guy was available because he just got off his shift in Afghanistan, sure, or what have you. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, you know, not that other accounting firms don't do that, but we feel a kind of an obligation because we understand how difficult it is for people who are living outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. to get things done and handled. You know, it's one thing to live in, you know, London or Germany or other, you know, U.S. friendly areas. You know, there's a lot of Dubai and a lot of other areas, Afghanistan, where maybe it's a little bit more challenging to find help and assistance. Sure, absolutely. Um, are you seeing a trend when it comes to expats as far as different regions that they're moving to? In, in different areas or countries? Well, the Middle East is, is growing substantially because we're pulling out from a military perspective, but we still need to install um, things there, infrastructure, roads. We gotta pull copper, fiber. We gotta, you know, we're trying to help those countries out, of course. Um, and that's going to more of the civilian contractor, the Halliburton, the L3s, the, those type of companies who ironically are taking military folks that are retired, they're hiring them as contractors, sending them over to Afghanistan or Pakistan or wherever, and then now they become an expat situation. I see, okay. So yes, that region, um, we're uh, of course continuing to see more of the India type of thing. I think a lot of guys have come here from India and now they're going back home really? and okay. they're, you know, they're still working as their IT consultant position or whatever they were holding here in the U.S. Sure. Uh, um, we don't see really any Canada, you know, we don't really see any of that. We see a little bit of London, you know, but in terms of a huge migration, we don't, we don't see a particular geography right yeah, now. I see. Okay. Very interesting. Well, um, you know, a lot of the audience at Expat Kingdom are really interested in moving to places like South America um, or Latin America. So, sure. you know, Central South America. Uh, Just had two guys move to Panama in the last month. So, yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing. See, and, and I'm hearing a lot about Panama. Um, I would say even more so about Ecuador at the moment. 
And I know Costa Rica at one point was a real big, you know, place, but yeah. it's really kind of started to die off. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that really got me started with Expat Kingdom was my own desire, my wife's desire to consider moving overseas. And so, um, you know, one of the things that when, when we started really getting into it, we were looking at um, income, you know, how is this going to affect us over there? Are we going to have to be filing taxes? Um, if we do go, you know, are, are we going to be exempt from any kind of taxes? And I know, um, you know, Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss is a big book that's out there, a very popular book. And one of the things he's talked about is a way that you could get exempt from certain portion of taxes um, up to a certain amount. And I've heard conflict whether or not that's actually accurate or not. And so, um, you know, I know I, just from previous conversations with you, you, you told me about the foreign earned tax exclusion, I, I believe is what it's called. Is that correct? It's called foreign earned income exclusion. Okay. And each of those, and I'm not trying to necessarily like hijack or interrupt what you're about to say, but each of those words has very specific and strong meaning in the eyes of the tax code and the IRS. So I'll say it again, it's foreign earned income exclusion. So it has to be foreign, that makes sense. It has to be earned income, meaning it can't be dividend income or investment income or like rental property income. It has to be your labor, your efforts earning an income. Okay. And then there's an exclusion, which means it's not a tax deduction, it's not a tax credit. They actually just exclude that income from the calculus. Okay. So it's a foreign earned income exclusion. So with that, if we could just kind of run through a couple scenarios maybe then, you know, on when, and, and I understand there's probably, you know, every detail or every situation or scenario is going to have little nuances that could affect it. Sure. Um, but I guess, let me just give you this one scenario. Let's say I um, earn my income from an employer here. And I actually live overseas in a country like Ecuador or um, Panama, what have you. You know, is that income going to be tax taxable, or can I do an exclusion or an exemption on it? Sure. So, you know, a good question, a very common question. There's two ways to exclude your income with the foreign earned income exclusion. The first one is what's called the physical presence test. Okay, and the second one's called the bona fide residence test. The physical presence test is the most common um, because all it looks at is how many days are you away and how many days are you in the U.S. And that test takes a rolling 365 days and does a look back and you have to be out of country for 330 of those 365 days. Okay. There are some nuances like travel days and things like that. Like if you travel, that travel day, you know, might or might not count depending on when you cross into foreign land. I mean, they get very technical, you know. So when I see people who are trying to have 33 or 34 days in the U.S., I tell them to be very, very careful, you know, because if this thing hinges on a few minutes of airtime over water versus land, I'd hate to have that be a $23,000 mistake. Oh, wow. Okay. Because yeah. that's basically what we're looking at is $23,000, $24,000 worth of tax savings. So um, I tell people be very careful about how much time. So fast forward, let's say <clears throat> July 1, you and your wife want to leave and go to Ecuador or go to Panama. July 1 through June 30th of the following year, we look at that. And we say, okay, you were gone for 330 days or more out of the rolling 365. Mm -hmm. Then you qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion. Okay. So let's say today that you're already in Ecuador and it's July 1 that you left. Okay. We would take your tax return. We would prepare it as if it's June 30th of 2015. Okay. And we would sit on it. We can't file it yet because we have to have a date that we put on the tax return that encompasses 365 days. Okay. Then, because you do do qualify, then you get what's called a prorated basis of the exclusion. The exclusion currently for this year is 99,200. So July 1 through December 31 is approximately 182 days. 
So, or half of that exclusion. And the exclusion actually works on a per day basis. When we type up your tax return and do all that stuff, the calculus actually looks at that 99,200 as a figure per day. So it's dividing by 365 timesing by the number of days that you were out of country, or I should say in a foreign country, and then you're able to get that excluded amount. Gotcha. Okay. So, and, and the 99,000 and change, 200. Yeah. That number, is that for single or for uh, married filing jointly? What is there any kind per of... Per taxpayer. I'm sorry? Per taxpayer. Okay. Per taxpayer that has earned income. So very common situation is, you know, the guy goes and gets a really good job over in Afghanistan, the wife just comes along, you know, then it's only 99200 But if she also works, then she gets her own exclusion as well. So we have a you know, level, several married couples, you know, typically they're in Lon you know, London or Germany or Hong Kong. Usually the Afghanistan assignments are kind of like a one-person show. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of folks going to, let's say, G20-type countries. The wife gets a job as well, or the husband gets a job if the wife is going over, and they both then enjoy the exclusion. So if, and if, let's just say the income earner was really only one of the, the cup, one individual in the couple, would that actually be able to go up to the 149000 Four hundred, or is that um, really going to stay then at just the ninety nine thousand two hundred? Ninety nine thousand two hundred per per person. So let's say you made one hundred fifty thousand dollars and your mm -hmm. wife made forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. You could only exclude ninety nine thousand two hundred of your income. All of hers would be excluded. I see, but you, you can't like combine the exclusion because gotcha. they look at per person in terms of giving you the exclusion and also per person in terms of making sure that you uh, qualify for the exclusion. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's really good to know. I'm sure some people would, you know, have that same exact question. If it is something that is, you know, be it being able to be combined or if it has to stay individual. So that's, right. that's, that's really good. Um, so, you know, when it comes to renting a home abroad, if you own a house here, uh, how does does that, that play into any of the the rules and the regulations when it comes to well actually let me back up a little you mentioned there's two ways and so we I think we covered the second way is called the bona fide occupation I'm sorry the bona fide residence test okay, okay. the bona fide residence test is more challenging because it requires an entire tax year to be looked at let's go with your example again you left July one right. <clears throat> We can either wait till the end of 2015 and amend your 2014 tax return, or what we commonly do is we qualify you under the physical presence test for the first half year or prorated year, and then the second year that you're over there for the entire calendar year, then we can do the bona fide um, residence test. The bona fide residence test is really nice because it does not limit your travel to the US, okay? So if you wanna come here for two, three week vacations, um, you could, you know, a lot of folks do. Um, they, you know, come back for the summertime, visit all their family and friends, and come back in the fall for the holidays, and, and that's great. As long as you always intend to return to your residence, which is in the host country, you can come back to the US as often as you like. A lot of these things are very preponderance oriented. You have to look at the preponderance of the evidence and you have to try to crawl into the mind of the person. And if they've always had the intent to keep their residence over in the foreign country and all those things, then the IRS allows it. So whenever we run into trouble with people trying to claim the exclusion and, and they get you questioned um, by the IRS, it's always like a an overall overarching type of perspective and the IRS tries to establish what your mindset is. So if your mind still thinks that, you know, the residence is in the U S but you're attempting to sell them on all these facts that add up to be the residences in the foreign country, you might lose still. So what, so in that situation <clears throat> then how, how do you get qualified as a bona fide? I guess would be, there's nothing like, special about it. There's two big caveats, well, three big caveats, right? It has to be an entire tax year, but then 
you know, after your first year, typically you're there for multiple years, so that's easy. You cannot make any statements to the foreign authorities to try to get out of their local tax by saying that you're not a resident of that country. So if you're in Ecuador, Ecuador knocks on your door and says, hey, Lane, I'd like you to pay our local tax. You say, whoa, 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 I'm not a resident of Ecuador. I'm a resident of the United States. Then you can't use that bona fide residence test. I see. Okay. And the last caveat is you cannot have any immediate plans to return back to the U.S. So guys will come to us with like a two-year contract going to Afghanistan. They want to be a bona fide resident. And I'm like, okay, it's kind of tough because after two years, you might get a contract extension. You might return to the U.S., you know, so on and so forth. But as it um, stands. So that gets to the gray area. Yeah. Now, you know, some folks are concerned like, okay, if I say I'm a bona fide resident and I have no intention of returning back to the U.S., if I return back to the U.S., you know, do I have to go back and amend my returns or does that blow everything up? And the answer is no. At the point that we file your tax return, in essence, at the point that you sign your tax return and we file your tax return, if you did not have any immediate plans of returning back to the U.S., you're golden, even if the very next day you do. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? It's yeah. that whole mindset that, you know, yeah, that's why this stuff is pretty specialized because there's so many ways to kind of screw this up, frankly. <laughs> sure. You know, a lot of hiccups, you know. Yeah. And sometimes I'll, I'll tell folks the rule before I ask the question because I can't unhear something. You know, we can't put toothpaste back in the tube, if you will. So I'll be like, hey, Lane, here's, here's what the IRS says the rule is. Now, tell me, what, what are your thoughts or what's your intentions or what are your actions? Well, that's, you know, that's actually kind of what my next question was going to be as far as, you know, if there's, if you see one of those two routes being more commonly used or preferred based on certain scenarios, or um, is it really just kind of a case by case basis? Physical presence is the easiest thing. And it's what I would say probably 80% of our guys are doing physical you know, presence testing. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, you know, for me, you know, when you and I started to speak and everything, this was, I mean, you've really covered everything that were, was the big gray area or the big question marks that I personally had. Um, I guess really at this point, I'm just wondering if there are any questions that you commonly see come up that you think would be worth sharing with the audience. Uh, and There's a lot of things, actually, and I'm glad you asked. Uh, you know, one of the big things is retirement planning, okay? In the United States, we have Social Security. In London, you have Social Security. In most G20 countries, have Social Security. So if you or some form, you know, they might call it something else. Canada's got their own name for it, and so does London or or um, or England, I should say. You can, if you pay into that system there, you can get out of having to pay into the system in the U.S. That's called a bilateralization agreement. We're basically saying, hey, we'll honor your system, you honor ours. At the end of the day, at the end of this world, we'll probably all even out. You know, There's so many British people coming here, so many Germans coming here. We have so many Americans going over there. It's a wash in, in all intents and purposes. So that's one thing. But so, if you are going to have – go ahead. Sorry. So, so does that mean essentially that if you were to pay in – let's just say you were to move overseas and you were to pay into their Social Security system – uh, and you're not paying into the United States Social Security system, when you go to retirement age to collect Social Security, you'll still be able to collect your, your share? Correct. Okay. Correct. If Social Security is going to look at 30 years of wage earning history, and that's going to determine your benefits, right? So if you're over in England for 10 years, you want to get, you know, I know you want to get some credit for that. Mm -hmm. And we've established those relationships with, 20 countries maybe. Okay, maybe. so there's about 20 countries. Well, and I'm, I'm yeah. assuming... It's all, it's all your G20, yeah. Japan, Germany, London, Spain, England, you know, things like that. Sure. I mean, you know, not everyone's on there. You right. know, Hong Kong's not on there. You know, there's, there's other states or countries where you have to be careful. Okay, so I would um, imagine so, we could probably Google that and find that list. Oh, somewhere. absolutely. It's on our website as well. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. So, sorry about that. Um, and then the other... 
so so that's one aspect of it. We also have folks that are, let's say, working in the Caribbean, okay? And this is kind of a gray area again where do you want to call yourself an employee of a foreign country, of a foreign company in a foreign country and opt out of having to pay into Social Security here in the U.S.? Or do you want to call yourself an independent contractor, which then forces you to pay into Social Security here in the U.S. through what we call self-employment taxes? Right. Those are questions that usually we have to talk to the client about and figure out which way they want to go with that. And again, that's more of that preponderance of, of their intent. So that's one thing. Uh, people are, they'll, they'll like do an IRA for themselves. So they'll contribute $5,500 per person into an IRA. An IRA actually will reduce your foreign earned income exclusion. So it's not like you can double dip or tack on extra exclusions to your income. So if you do, let's say, $5,000 into a traditional IRA, now your foreign earned income exclusion reduces by that same $5,000. Okay. Okay. So what, what we'll see people doing is, is you know, doing IRAs like that. We're like, that's, you know, don't do that. Do a Roth IRA, mm -hmm. which is not a tax deferred vehicle mm -hmm. um, because you're already getting your income excluded. So if you're making $80,000, and you put money into a traditional IRA, it's kind of silly, right? Because the money you put into the traditional IRA would have already been excluded from income tax by the foreign earned income exclusion. Much better off putting into a Roth because now that money got excluded on the front side and is also going to be excluded on the back side, yeah. which is pretty cool. Yeah. So, so we'll advise things on that with clients. We There's also um, the foreign tax credit Okay, so you can take the foreign earned income exclusion or the foreign tax credit, or you can take some sort of combination of that, and any unused foreign tax credit will roll forward to future years. And there's a lot of calculus that goes into that. But for example, we have a client of ours, he makes about $350,000 living in London. Okay, London's got an exceptionally high tax rate, yeah. over 50%. Okay. His foreign tax credit actually gave him a better tax position than taking the foreign earned income exclusion. Okay. So he did not take any of the exclusion, took the foreign tax credit, and then you know that actually put him in a better tax position. And those scenarios we run all yeah. the time. We're always yeah. trying to like optimize, if you will. Yeah. Um, there's also high cost cities. So you have your 99200 but if you lived in London, Singapore, Hong Kong, Tokyo, it, some of these high-cost cities, and those are all available on the IRS's website and ours, and they're updated every year, those give you extra uh, exclusion on top, and that's called the foreign housing exclusion okay. Okay, due to a high-cost city. And again, the calculus is kind of like a mix of, of both exclusions. Okay, so those are some other variables that we always have to kind of get involved with and sure. be detailed with. Um, I guess I guess that's really you know, kind of it from a ten thousand foot perspective. Sure. You know, yeah, um, there's a whole other issue with states that's very concerning. When you leave the United States, you need to no longer be a resident of that state that you were in originally. California, for example, does not honor the foreign earned income exclusion. If you leave California and intend to return back to California, California will attempt to tax you on all that income that you earned overseas. So before you leave, we need you to turn in like your driver's license, turn in your auto registrations. We need you to get rid of everything that's tying you to California. Now, if you have a, a house or a a property, sure. that's fine. And you don't have to rent out your house. You can call that a second home. That's fine as well. That does not give you nexus or residency in that particular okay. state. But we always want people to be very cautious about just packing up and leaving. No, no. Right before you pack up and leave, turn over all the things that tie you to California. Um, make sure you're not a, a registered voter 
in that jurisdiction anymore. Make sure now that you attempt to do mail-in, you know, um, ballots only. Massachusetts doesn't it doesn't honor the foreign earned income exclusion either. You know, so you know, the, you know, there's a handful of states where you can really get burned badly. Yeah. Okay. You know, if you can if you can attempt to establish residency in Washington or Nevada or Texas or Wyoming or um, South Dakota, Florida, New Hampshire, Tennessee, any of these tax-free states, oh, that's sure. ideal. Yeah, that but that's makes, not always that practical. Either. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So um, then how we avoid that typically just by not filing a state return. So we'll typically only, only, only file a federal tax return I for see. most people. Yeah. Unless you do have you know property or something like that, then we'll file you as a non-resident. Um, so if you were to to pack up and leave and rent your house out, we'll still have to file a tax or a return for your local state as a non-resident um, because you have an income-producing asset inside, I'm um, sorry, inside your taxing jurisdiction. Okay. All right. Good. So when it comes to doing this, you know, if you're going to be moving overseas, it sounds like just based on everything you were just describing, especially around the state and everything. Uh, it would be really advantageous for people to actually consult with somebody like yourself prior to actually mo moving overseas. Is that absolutely? A lot of folks come. I mean, that's a great question, and then it's like anything else. I wish people would ask us about a lot of decisions before they do them. Sure. You know, because we can't change some things. You know, and if if you just bolt and leave, and then never turn over your driver's license or your auto regs for your car. Wow, now it's kind of tough, you know. Right. We just had a case where a lady moved from um, you know, Colorado to Germany, and Colorado's like, "Hey, we want tax returns," and we had to have her give us a copy of this lease that was in German. We had to get it translated, send it over to Colorado, and say, "Hey, she's no longer in your state." And the reason why they thought that she was still a resident in their state was that she didn't turn over her driver's license. She still had a a, a car registered, even though it was not current, her car was still you know, registered in her state. Because sure. we said, hey, she no, she no longer lives here. And Colorado's like, that's great, but we show a driver's license, we show two cars, <laughs> we show a voter record. We're like, okay, you know, so then we had to <laughs> kind of go go backwards. And that's fine, you know, uh, you know, Colorado was okay with it. Not everybody's going to be okay with that. So clean house before you move out of, of your house, gotcha. you know? Okay. Now, yeah. and, and you're based in Colorado, but that does not limit you or restrict you from doing uh, taxes for people in, from other states. Or, or no, 80% of the clients that we serve are outside of, of, of Colorado. Okay. All right. That's great to know. Well, listen, I, I, uh, I really appreciate your time today. It was tons of great, valuable information. Um, why don't you let people know where they can find you? I know you've got a, a big resource on your website with tons of information too. So if you want to just let people know where they can find you, that'd be great. Absolutely. Three ways. Um, you can you can call us. If you have a Google phone overseas, you can call us with 719-387-9800. Uh, That's our main phone number here. Um, you can go to our website, which is just watsoncpagroup.com. So Watson CPA group.com or you could uh, attempt to call us via Skype and our Skype handle is Watson CPA group um, and I'm Jason Watson we have 13 people who work here five of us are CPAs um, and expat taxes is what we do a lot of great all right well thank you again for your time today I really appreciate it you're welcome, Lane. And um, as, as your your project rolls out, you might have more questions, and be more than happy to answer them or do this again. 